everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, so welcome to From Snakelets to Pythonistas. I'm going to talk about um, teaching Python in public school classrooms. So first, I just want to introduce myself. Um, <clears throat> I am the teacher in residence at Cornell Tech. That is a graduate uh, campus of Cornell University in New York City. My primary job there is to work on solving the problem of scaling quality computer science in New York City public schools. Um, and I do that through uh, training teachers, coaching teachers, uh, consulting with schools on curriculum and developing curriculum. Um, I also am a teacher in the School of Education at Hunter College, and I worked on writing the national K-12 CS framework and national K-12 CS standards. Um, and please go ahead and tweet me at Teach Python. All right. So this journey began in the 90s. Um, I saved my babysitting money for two years so that I could go to space camp. And there I decided I would be an aerospace engineer. And I was dedicated. I also met my hero, astronaut Mae Jemison, at that time. And I knew that's what I was going to do. When it came time, I was finally in college. When it came time to enroll in my first CS class, I had never written a line of code before. I decided, hmm, you know, I just don't think this is for me. Seems a little boring. And I ended up majoring in theater and was a starving actor in another life. Um, so that is really what drives and motivates me to teach kids because I want them to have the opportunity to write that line of code and discover if this is something that is or isn't for them. Because years later, when I did write my first line of code and caught the bug, I realized that um, I made a mistake all those years ago. Um, so now I'm part of a movement that is both local and national called Computer Science for All. Uh, has anyone heard of this movement? Show of hands. One person, all right. Um, so the idea behind Computer Science for All is that we want to teach every single kid a baseline of computer science. So that means they don't have to test into it. They don't have to opt into an elective. They don't have to have a specific math score. They don't have to be available after school. They don't have to pay for a summer camp. Um, the vision is to have computer science during the school day for every student in the school. And we're not doing that because we think 100% of students will become software engineers. Uh, just the same way we don't teach science in K-12 to because we think every single student will be a research scientist. We do it because they need a baseline of science literacy to contribute to society, to vote, um, and often to do their jobs. So uh, computers, computer science, and technology is also just as vital a literacy for students to have. Um, so you know how sort of after you write your first program or take your first CS class, you automatically become the IT person for everybody you know? So we don't want that to happen anymore. We want to educate the first generation of, techno of uh, computationally literate students. And that doesn't mean that they can pick up an iPhone and figure out any game within five minutes because we don't want to create more users. Um, we want students who can create and who understand the underlying processes. So what does this look like in action? Well, the first thing it looks like is our classrooms. They are wonderfully diverse. And they're also challengingly diverse. Um, so in a typical classroom in New York City, uh, uh, I'll just use myself as an example. You'll have a teacher who is self-taught. They may have been asked to teach computer science with no prior knowledge. They may have one or two courses, and it's sort of a hobby. Um, but they are learning along with the students. And then they have a class. 
of up to 34 kids plus with only one teacher. Um, up to a third of those students might have disabilities. Many of those students may be learning English. Um, and no matter what school you're in, you will always have um, a range of cultural identities, gender identity, and just personal interests. And all of those things are really important to teaching, and they're really important to teaching computer science. So teachers who are just learning Python and computer science for the first time are finding new ways to reach kids and are redefining the way that we're introducing kids to computer science. So Python has become a very popular language to do this in. Um, so we are super hip. Um, I had a teacher the other day say, oh, well, you know, all the schools use Python. Maybe I'll try to use something else. I, and I was like, oh, we're like mainstream. So <laughs> here's why it works so well for CS for All. First, it's object oriented. Um, this is developmentally appropriate for the cognitive level that our uh, students are at, especially if we start them in middle school where they're developing, um, they're still developing the capacity for abstract thought. Starting with an object and thinking, constructing your thinking around that is very helpful. The syntax is straightforward. The kids don't have to type curly brackets. It's readable. They can look at code and kind of figure out what's going on. There's a range of libraries. This is so great because that means we can use Python in a bunch of different subject areas. And we can also use libraries to strategically hide complexity when, it's, uh, when we need to. Uh, it's got street cred with students. When they hear that YouTube uh, is written in Python, they cannot wait to write Python. Um, and a bunch of other companies that they've heard of. And finally, it has an active and supportive community so that once they start learning, they have somewhere to go. So uh, just to give you an idea of what this actually looks like in the wild, um, I'm going to give you a tour of a school. And this school is a mishmash of the different schools I work in around New York City. So please imagine with me walking through the bright red doors of this school. And first off, we're going to start in the kindergarten classroom. And no, the kindergartners aren't using Python. Um, what they are doing is building towers with marshmallows and popsicle sticks. So as we watch, see all the kindergartners building away, and suddenly the tallest tower falls over, and the kid stands there. And there's this tense silence. Oh, and my computer's going to run out. I want to find it. I don't know where my thing went. Oh, here it is. Oh my gosh, it was a very tense silence, standing for a long time. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the kid jumps up and says, yes, I got a bug. And he holds up a picture of a cartoon bug. As soon as he does that, he and his partner start talking about how they can rebuild so it'll stand up. So we are introducing uh, major concepts and vocabulary right away. Just like we don't want kids to start algebra without any arithmetic, we don't want kids to start all of a sudden programming in high school with no prior knowledge. So we'll move on to a second grade room. These kids are doing an unplugged activity, um, meaning they don't have devices. What they're doing is cutting out paper arrows and putting them in a sequence. Their partner then uses that sequence to move a cutout character around a grid. So this is getting them ready to code, and it's using sort of logo style introduction. Now, we can do this at higher grade levels with Python. So one way I've done that is to take a Python command, make a card deck of it, and have kids 
uh, direct each other around the room or create designs on their desk with beans. And then I have them go and uh, write the exact same program when they're done. Okay, we'll move on to fourth grade. We're moving up a little bit. Um, so in this fourth grade room, they, these fourth graders are solving the problem of climate change right now. They are prototyping, they have brainstormed and are prototyping a device that will solve climate change. Um, and most of the kids are doing this in Scratch, um, which is a language made of blocks, digital blocks that snap together like Legos on the screen. It has no syntax. Um, but this group of students is doing the exact same task in Python. And when I asked the teacher, she said, I have no idea what they're doing. Their parents are in tech. So, so that's actually something that comes up a lot. A lot of professional developers I know say, oh, you know, my kids started Python at eight years old. Well, that's not a, appropriate in a general fourth grade classroom. However, we never want to hold kids back. So any time that we can do the exact same project um, in multiple languages and the students can use the one that is most challenging for them, that is a plus. This is an example of one way uh, that Python could be used. Um, so these blocks, this is a, this is a website called Trinket.io by Elliot Hauser. Um, these blocks are specifically made to correspond with Python. So some kids could run this turtle program using blocks. And you could have other kids who run the exact same program writing Python like normal. I don't know. So let's pop over to sixth grade. In this grade, they're all using Python to create a game. But they're using a special educational platform. And full disclosure, I worked on this platform. Um, in this platform, they are moving blocks, dropping them into the editor, and when they do, it turns into text. So this is a tool that is made specifically to transition students from blocks that almost all schools use to text. We're finding that um, blocks are being used up through the end of high school. And part of my goal is to get uh, teachers to move students to Python much earlier, sometime around sixth or seventh grade if possible. Um, so this tool helps them directly make those connections. And uh, finally, so we'll also visit the seventh grade room. Um, now, if you went into this room, it would be pretty chaotic and loud. You might not know what's going on. Um, what they're actually doing is they're building a biome project. This is the back of one project because the front of it lights up. Now, that's just building circuits, but these students were able, we were able to connect their paper circuits uh, with a makey makey um, to a scratch program that gave, that read out their report. So when they flip these switches they made, it turns on their LED and it plays their program. We're in the process of porting this uh, project to Python. Um, I'm really excited to hear about uh, MicroPython and the other microcontroller that's coming out because I might use that. I was planning to use a tool called Hummingbird, um, which can sit on either an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Um, but there's lots more tools coming out. Um, Something really important is to use computer science in other uh, subject areas. So it's not just a dedicated class. Every school can't afford to do that, especially if um, they have to prove uh, that they have high test scores to stay open or to get funding. Um, so it's really important that kids learn uh, programming and computer science and use it as a creative tool or as a problem solving tool in other courses. A final example of that 
that we were to go to this ninth and 10th grade classroom, uh, they're working on an ELA project or an English literature project. Um, pairs of students chose a classic novel and read it and then pair programmed an RPG using Python um, that would allow the user to experience the core themes of the novel. So what is the impact of all this? This is all very exciting. How does this affect the Python community? Um, well, as Python is becoming more and more popular in high school and K-12 in general, um, it's also becoming popular in undergraduate studies. Um, as of 2014, I don't have a more current statistic. According to the ACM, Python was the most popular uh, CS1 language, and it's been adopted by colleges like M MIT and UC Berkeley. So as colleges are also changing how they teach computer science, it will have an impact on industry, um, and use in industry will go up. Another impact is that, especially in K-12, um, as it's becoming more popular, teachers are creating um, just a plethora of new tools for beginners. Uh, I could name at least 10 different Python platforms right now that are tutorials. Um, and that's in addition to videos, lesson plans, and books. So all of this widens the funnel of our pipeline for Python users. So we talk about, oh, there's this diversity problem in tech, which there is. And we try to solve it by recruiting by saying like, oh, let's have a pink themed recruiting uh, initiative or you know, fill in the blank recruiting initiative. That will not solve the problem. Um, this problem will be solved when kids have access to high quality computer science education regardless of where they live or where they go to school. So as a Python community, um, I already feel that this community is incredibly supportive um, and bringing in the next generation is what will grow and widen our circle. Let me skip through that. Um, really quickly, so I feel like there's sort of two silos of Python education. One is in the Python community. We're all here meeting about education. We have this summit and there are Python education summits around the globe. Um, separately, in education, run by, uh, sponsored by school districts, there are teacher meetups and movements that are pushing CS and Python. And those movements are both gaining momentum sort of in silos. So um, we always teach that first we have to get the what, the content. That has to be right. That's what I have to work on with my teachers. But then they have to do it well. They have to learn how to teach it to reach all students. And that's the part that uh, programmers and the Python community, that's the piece that the education community can bring. Um, so how do we work together? What are some practical solutions? Um, I have a few ideas. Uh, the first is volunteer in classrooms. There are two organizations that I know of that bring programmers into the classroom um, to teach students, but also to teach the teacher how to teach the class. So uh, that's Teals uh, by Microsoft. Hopefully these will be shared out, I don't know. Um, and Script Ed is local to California and New York, but Teals is national. And Teals also reaches rural areas through virtual coaching. Um, you can advocate. Uh, there are multiple movements in every state to change the graduation requirements and to adopt CS standards. So they need to, each state government needs to hear voices of educators and programmers, um, letting them know that this is important. Next is if you're creating tools and materials that are educational, don't just think about that after school program. Don't just think about a really fun camp um, or a group of, what a group of 10 kids can all do. Think about what it might look like in a classroom. 
Um, and finally, partner up. We have a really strong community. Um, if you live in a city, you may have a Python meetup. In New York City, we have a Python meetup. Um, you may also have either an educator, a CS educator meetup, or a CSTA chapter. CSTA is Computer Science Teachers Association. Um, invite each other to events. Uh, attend their events. Invite them to your events. And think about partnering. Um, for example, a Python meetup and a teacher meetup might work together to co-lead an hour of code during computer science education week. Thank you so much. Do we have any time for questions? I have time for maybe one or two questions. Oh, great. Uh, I usually switch kids to a keyboard at second grade, and that's usually because they don't have a mouse. They only have a uh, second, yeah. They only have a trackpad, and the trackpad is even harder than the keyboard, um, especially when they're developing fine motor skills. Um, there's an app called Scratch Junior now for uh, preschool through first grade, um, and there's also robots that can be coded by putting together physical blocks um, that are really great for young kids. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so every teacher I work with, that is an issue. That will happen wherever you are. Um, so the first thing is to proactively and explicitly teach them what to do when they don't know what to do or when they get stuck. Um, I also, uh, part of my research is in special education, so I also like to do things like uh, provide sentence starters for asking for help. So sometimes students don't know how to ask their friend for help. They just say, I don't, it's not working, right? So I give them sentence starters like, uh, my prog I want my program to. Right now my program is, right? Those sorts of supports. And then I have a protocol that I call walk the room. I walk a pattern, I show the kids the pattern, and I don't deviate from the pattern no matter what. I spend one minute or less with each kid. If I can't solve their problem in one minute, then I give them a specific problem solving task and check back in on them when I come around. This way I don't spend my entire class time with maybe four or five kids that are really struggling and never get to help one, the kids in the middle and two, those kids that really need to be pushed forward. Yeah, so all of my curriculum um, will be open source through Cornell Tech. Everything we do is open source. Uh, we have a commitment to impacting K-12 CS education. Um, so right now we have a pilot uh, database and that will be public at some point. Um, but I'm also happy for you to email me. It is hard for parents to get into a lot of schools. Um, one thing that's really important as a parent is advocating to the principal how important it is to you. Um, because a lot of principals don't realize, Google did research that they published earlier this year that showed that parents valued CS very highly, but principals were completely unaware of that and did not value it. 
um, in general. So letting them know that will kick, could hopefully kickstart some kind of program. Uh, there are lots of objections. Things like, you know, my kids don't have time. They just have to pass this math exam or they're not going to get into, you know, a middle school or a high school. And I don't mean like a prep school. I mean a school <laughs> that they can learn something in, right? So it is one of the biggest challenges is time during the day. Another thing is schools don't have funding a lot of times to bring in these projects, like the hands-on stuff is really engaging. Well, that's something, schools can get computers, but they can't get a pack of robots or circuit boards, um, things like that. Um, and then also just, you know, some people think um, it's not important or they're worried that it might displace arts, things like that. I would love to see it integrated into art. Uh, we're doing some e-textiles in an art class um, coming up. So those are those are some common ones. Yeah. So not much yet. Um, there hasn't been much. There is a great need for research in this area. Computational thinking is a very big deal and it's very trendy, but we don't have enough research yet to show that it improves math scores. Um, and this is also something at Cornell Tech, we also do education research, but uh, it's very difficult to do research in schools because uh, they don't really know the purpose. It's hard to have a stranger come in and observe. Um, so there are obstacles. Thank you very much. I would love uh, to continue this conversation. Please feel free to contact me.
Bye, kid. And I'd just like to apologize in advance for my voice. I'm just feeling, I have a bit of a sore throat today. So just pardon if I start coughing intermittently. So here's just a brief overview of my talk. So first I'll talk about what my experience was learning to program. Um, and then from, from my experience, I'll tell you what I learned and what, how this information can be used to teach programming to younger kids, like from uh, elementary through middle school. And then I'll talk about, what, I'll talk about um, teaching uh, programming to high schoolers. And, and then I'll, just end, I'll end it with a brief summary. So a little bit about me. I'm a high school junior right now. And I, I program in Python, Java, and R. And obviously, Python's my favorite. And um, my current interests include machine learning, data science, bi and bioinformatics. And I, I teach uh, programming at my local community center uh, once a month. So first, let's start off with my experience programming. So uh, I started programming in elementary school. Uh, and uh, my first language is Scratch, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you've heard of, of Scratch. It's a very simple drag and drop programming language with a visual interface. So this is what the interface looks like. So in the right 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 side, you have the 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 visual interface. So you can control your actors or sprites as they're called in Scratch. And on the left hand side, you have all of the drag and drop blocks which control your actors. And this is for uh, for younger kids. I really I really like using Scratch or any drag and drop language because, uh, first of all, it's it's visual, and for younger kids especially, the visual aspect is very important, as they can see what's going on, see get visual feedback from their code, and see what's going on. And also, you can't really make any syntax errors using Scratch because only certain blocks can only go in certain places, and if you try to put something which doesn't belong, it'll just automatically reject that. So you can't really make any mistakes. But if you, in the chance that you do make a mistake in putting a wrong, the wrong value for a block, you'll see your error visually. And like if you code the fish, the big green fish in the middle incorrectly, you'll see, oh, that's not doing what I want it to do. And then you can easily correct it from there. So then at age 14, I decided to make the jump from a visual programming language like Scratch to uh, APCS, which is AP Computer Science course, which was online and taught in Java. And for a 14-year-old, I had to go from this to this. So uh, first of all, as you can probably tell, there are a ton of differences between a Java and Scratch. So first of all, there's no visual interface. So for a kid, I really liked the visual aspect of Scratch, and that really helped me understand what my code was doing. But in Java, since it's a more traditional text-based programming language, uh, you couldn't really see what was going on with your code. You would just uh, compile it, run, and then see what the output gave you in the bottom. And on top of that, uh, if you made an error, you would, you would compile it, run it, and then the, the Java, then Java would tell you that hey you you're missing a semicolon or you forgot a bracket and I and I didn't like that I actually I preferred it when you, it would not it would prevent you from creating the error in the first place like in Scratch how you just couldn't drag a block to a certain place but in Java you could do whatever the heck you wanted and then and then only after you compiled it after only after you compiled it then it would give you errors and I that was the aspect of learning interp of of text-based languages, which I really disliked. Um, so I, that gave me a real, the, the whole Java experience gave me a really sour taste in my mouth with programming in, gener in general, so I just didn't code for like a year. And then fast forward to when I'm in high school, I have nothing to do for the summer, so I just, I just decided to pick up Python. And the way I learned Python was I didn't really take any courses, I just looked on YouTube, Stack Overflow was my best friend, I looked through Code Academy, which is a interactive coding, uh, interactive coding website, and yeah, pretty much I just self-studied uh, all of uh, all of uh, Python, and to this day, Python is my favorite, and I, I've never stopped. So, from my experience, there was one major problem for me, and that was that I didn't learn what I wanted to learn. For for example, when when I was doing Scratch, if I wanted to make Pac-Man, I could just draw a yellow circle, create a maze, make it so that. Pa 
if on if touching the maze bounce off and then create a, bun a million of those little dots for him to eat and then I could I could be done and play that all day long but with Java when I was taking the course it was more of a fixed thing like okay here's an assignment where you have to calculate the, the change after you pay someone from a register and like who cares I don't even have a credit card so I found that to be extremely boring and the main, so the main problem was that I didn't learn what I wanted to. So now I'll go on to how some of this can be used to teach uh, younger kids how to code. So first, I would recommend a drag and drop language like Scratch. There's also another language called Tinker, which is basically Scratch, except it's web-based, so you can save everything in the cloud. It's awesome. Uh, and then from there on, uh, based on what the, your student or child likes, uh, just go into that field. So after you're done with after you're done with Scratch, I would recommend going to Python because simply because it's really easy to use and it's a very fr it's very friendly, especially for kids. Java for me wasn't a very friendly uh, first programming language. So for me, so I would recommend using Python as the first programming language. And then from there on, once he he or she has mastered uh, programming in Python. Um, he or she can continue using Python or move on to, or depending on what he or she likes, then you can move on to other languages. Like if they like the visual aspect and they really like using Pygame, for example, maybe they can create more video games, Unity, or design graphics, um, use, do HTML, CSS, etc. Or they can stick with Python, or if they're more interested in like, in uh, competitive programming, like Java and C are very popular for those, so they can essentially choose their own path, and whatever your student likes, I'd recommend just go with the language which best suits them. So now let's move on to teens, something I'm more familiar with. So uh, as of now, in schools, there are two, um, there are two uh, computer science courses. There's AP Computer Science A, which is taught in Java, and uh, AP Computer Science Principles, or APCSP, which is a more recent uh, course, which was just introduced by the College Board just like a couple a couple of years ago, I think. And it, and AP just means Advanced Placement. It's just something. Uh, it's you can these courses can be uh, you can take these courses and then you can earn college credit, so you can skip an introductory programming class in college. So I'll briefly go over what each of these uh, courses. Uh, entail. So you have AP Computer Science A or just APCS. Um, the nice thing about this is that it teaches uh, important computer science concepts like uh, like big O, recursion, iteration, data structures, etc. However, one of the problems with this course is that it's very syntax heavy. So if you want to do well on many of the tests, you have to be well versed in Java and many of the tests are like are simply Java are very syntactical. And there's also very few projects. So basically what it is, you'd go into class, the teacher would explain, uh, br explain briefly a concept, and then you'd gi be given an assignment for the day, and then you would just be expected to turn that in by the end of the day. So there's no long-term projects, it's just a projects on a daily, daily basis. AP Computer Science Principles, or APCSP, the more recent course, um, the nice thing about it is that it's language agnostic, so it's not in Java, uh, but it, it uses drag and drop. It's very high level, like it doesn't teach any, most of what jo of APCS teaches, like big O, recursion, et cetera. But the good thing is that it's more project-based. So instead of having daily, uh, daily assignments, you, you're, you have more long-term projects. So uh, what, what one of the course requirements is that you complete a few long-term projects and then submit that uh, to the graders of of uh, the college board, and you and based on how good your projects is broad projects are in terms of uh, complexity and how innovative they are, you'll be scored. So here's just a brief uh, side by side comparison. So what would an ideal course be? Well, I think it should take aspects of both. Uh, APCS and APCSP. So well, I spoke with many of my uh, AP Computer Science uh, classmates and they thought that um, they didn't like it that the course was all in Java 
uh, they thought they would rather have it in other languages like Python, Java, and C, um, and a whole other bunch of languages. And specifically that the unit which is being taught, like uh, data science or big O or something, that, that unit should, the, that the programming language which it is best at should be used for that unit. So maybe object-oriented, you could, if you're doing a lesson on object-oriented, you could use Java or Python, because Python's also good with that. Um, there should be more projects, like in AP Computer Science Principles, less syntax tests, and it should also teach important computer science concepts, um, like in APCS. Okay, so now let's put yourselves in the mind of a, a beginning coder, of a kid, and let's go through what a kid thinks when, it's, when he or she sees code like this. So uh, pretend you are a, uh, a beginning programmer and you don't have very much experience, if at all. So I have here three examples. You have a simple hel uh, print hello world, uh, a stepping through a col collection, and, and creating a simple function just to return the square of a number. So, the nice thing about Python that is that it's very readable and it's very easy to understand. So if it, when a kid sees print hello world, it's, it's the Python, it says exactly what it's supposed to do, just say hello world. And when you're stepping through a collection, you just print each element in that collection. When you're defining a function to uh, square a number, it just says return the number times itself. So it's very easy to read. If we look at something like Java, um, where I'm doing the same thing, except a kid's gonna wonder why. What is what does public class main mean? And remember, this is this is uh, a beginning programmer with very little experience. So the kid's gonna wonder what the heck is public class main? What does void mean? What is static? What is args? What what, what is it's the kid's gonna wonder what all that extraneous extraneous code is? So for beginning pro programmers, uh, since Java has a lot of extra stuff which hasn't been explained yet, you're essentially leaving the kid on, you're leaving the kid hanging. Like you'll, you're, go, you're gonna have to say, oh, I'll explain what main is. I'm gonna explain what classes are in a later section. So you leave the kid hanging. So that's not, a, that's not an ideal situation to be in. Okay, so now let's say um, you've, the, ki uh, the student or kid has uh, progressed more in programming. And now you wanna explain what a private and public uh, functions and classes are. So this here we're defining a, a private function within the class something called say hello, and it just prints hello. So in Python, since it's very simple, you just have, there's no, like you don't explicitly say like public, def, public, say hello. Instead what you do is you just put two underscores right before the function. And, but, if you look at something like Java, I, th I think that Java ex does this a little bit better since it explicitly says private void say hello. Since it explicitly says private, uh, private say hello, it better explains that uh, this function can, cannot be called outside of this because it says private. So I think what we can take away from this is that you should use the programming language which, which best, ex which is the most explicit when uh, defining functions or doing anything in general, and you should do it the one which does it the most succinctly as well. So let's, let's look at one more example, but not so much as not so much syntax, but rather a CS, uh, a computer science concept. So here I'm just creating a Java array uh, of length five, and I'm just putting the same value 95 five times. So Quick question, I know this is a Python conference, but what happens if you do the first line system.out.print uh, data? So what that does, it, it, prints, it, prints a, uh, it prints the ID for that, for that array data. So it'll print something like bracket i at, and then a random jumble of numbers and letters. So, but when you do the, uh, when you execute the second line, which is, uh, arrays dot two string a uh, data that actually prints out 95. So I think in this case, Java explains that uh, variables are data does not actually contain the 95 five times. Instead, it just has the hash 
ID for data, which is stored somewhere in memory. And you have to call the toString method for data, since arrays don't override the object.toString method. But, and if you look at Python, uh, this, this would be a really good example for something for a beginning programmer, like if you, for, you're just creating a tuple with the same values and you print it and it'll return 95 and it doesn't return the, the, the hash ID. So I think in this, in this case, uh, when explaining the concepts of how, how data uh, or how uh, variables are stored, I think Java does a better job than Python. So if you just look at all of these examples together, I would say just use the language which just which best exemplifies whatever you're trying to teach. So if you're just beginning, if you're starting with a, a, a beginning programmer, use Python. If you're doing data science, use Python. If you wanna do object-oriented, even Python is good, but maybe you wanna use a mix of Python and Java to convey what you're, whatever you're trying to teach. So I in summary, um, just, Whatever your student wants to be taught, just explain whatever, just uh, use the language which best exemplifies it. And keep it project-based because uh, a student gets really motivated when they see a, a long-term project complete. Like I know for me, it's a big motivation whenever I complete my, whenever I complete a big project and it's on GitHub and I tweet about it. So I make, it gets me really motivated. And, uh, and I think, uh, the programming language which you use to teach the uh, CS concept, you, sh you should have a visual understanding. So use a lot of print statements to see what the heck is going on in your code, especially since these interpreted languages don't, uh, don't have a visual interface built in. So just use a lot of print statements. That's how I debug my code sometimes. So when, whenever you see something printed to your console, uh, it gives you a better understanding of what is going on. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, I'll take any questions. You mentioned you uh, teach at Mindy. Mm -hmm. like oh, I'm in the Bay Area, so I just go once a month to my city community center. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, because in currently uh, uh, Java is used for APCS. So, oh, so because they're more concerned with like sin I know Python is a bit different, but I think because a lot of the a lot of these kids um, they they'll be coming from APCS background, so they'll understand how like Java works in general. So they m I think I feel like they might get confused if they. Uh, see how Python works, although it is more readable. But I would, s but uh, I would say that they should start with Python instead of Java to begin with, so they can understand it both ways. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I w we have like an e emailing list so that. Um, they just they just email their questions. Uh, are you talking about like during the class or after? Oh no, this is this is not assignment based. I'll just uh, teach. I'll just uh, have a concept which is taught uh, for the meeting briefly, and then uh, the kid, the students can go home, uh, try it out for themselves, and then they can at the next meeting they can bring it back, and then they can show to the rest of the students what they're doing.
the challenge for us, the cities were a little less compared to the outside. So I would like to thank you all for your talk and uh, let's continue the journey. This fine gentleman is going to get his laptop all set up. And uh, it's going to wow you guys. All right, Hi, so there's your on the side. Just hang on. Sweet. Okay. Look over here because you can see this screen, and it'll show you exactly what's over there. So get your stuff over here. Some folks on the screen, right? Yeah. And here, Greg will take us off of this and turn it over to him. Oh, okay. So we'll go from the other side. We'll have our uh, moderator. Yeah, I think we should get off. Nope. Uh, what happened last time? Sometimes, oh, it could be, yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Put the full screen. And what we'll do is we'll click with our eyeballs. So hop on down from the back for a sec. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Ane. Uh, I'm 11 years old, and my talk today is, is Python for grade school. Sorry. So a little bit about myself. I'm a fifth grader at Chadbourne Elementary in Fremont, California. Uh, my hobbies are basketball, reading. So I like <coughs> in basketball. I like to play basketball at school especially. I like reading history books. Um, one of my favorite subjects is history, and I absolutely love playing video games. Um, I code in, I sometimes I code in Python, JavaScript, and some C. So currently I'm working on a, a tic-tac-toe in Python. In C, I wrote a program with my dad. It calculates all the prime numbers until a certain digit. And in JavaScript on Code Academy, I made a choice game, which is like a yes or no game. So let's cut to the chase. Should kids code in grade school? My answer is yes. Kids have the potential, and Python's, Python makes it easy. In our school today, we, d we do typing, some coding, and we look at Google Docs. <coughs> I, want the, I want this. Uh, we can learn something new by coding in Python. Well, why Python? First of all, Python is easy to understand. Since it is like English, it is easy to communicate. Second of all, the Python editors are easy to access because there's so many and you don't have to download anything. 
I especially have fun with the Jupiter Jupiter Notebook. <coughs> I could save it. I could save it by downloading it and come back easily. Third of all, mom loves it. She started Pi Kids and teaches kids like me. So this is my lesson plan. So if I get this here. And so if I go next. Here I'm coming. Um, so it's not working right now, but my first lesson was called, <coughs> it was the introduction to Python. So we watched a video by Khan Academy called, What is Programming? This means that the co we learned that the computer is like an obedient pet. It will do what it is told to do. We started with basic fundamentals like the print command. We use numbers by, s we can calculate numbers by simply inserting the numbers and operations like usual. When I used the Python notebook, I found out it also behaves like a calculator. For example, 343 times 16 is 5,488. I tried to understand what infinity would be like, but I ran the command and the server hung up. These were the first steps in order to understand the code in Python. So he's having some technical challenges there. <laughs> Accessing two screens. Why are multiple screens? No. Okay. Oh, so I'll just continue. Um, so lesson two is called "What's in a Name." So in this next lesson, I learned that I not only do I can I multi multiply and manipulate numbers, but I can also manipulate words by using strings. I can add and multiply words together. I'm not sure what I can use it yet, but I might I might be used to make banners. For example, I could write Happy Halloween times 200, and that could be used in the Halloween carnival. Lesson three. This was one of my favorite lessons because it was called Fun with Art. In this lesson, we used a program called the Pi Figlet. A Pi Figlet is a full port is a full port of Figlet. <coughs> we learn how to use help. Which is which tells you what's how to use something. Um, it, there would have been a picture on the right, but we would have typed the word missile using a Star Wars font. Lesson four: colorful grids. In this final lesson, we learned about grids and IPython blocks. Grids are used to develop websites and designs, which is why we learned to code them in Python. We looked up the help for grids and documentation and figured out that we had to use block grid. Block grid is a tool that, that takes the size and the color of the grid. It contains parameters that can be filled according to the coder's satisfaction. If you want a 10 times 10 grid, the block grid will help with that. I wanted to make a chessboard with grids. I figured it will take way too many loops. Um, so there was supposed to be a demo, but um, I couldn't put it on. Sorry about that. Obviously, this is not Ubuntu friendly. So, <laughs> should work. Yeah, and we can go to the Jupyter node. Jupyter. Okay, so we left off here. So this was the Python reasons. 
And this was um this was the main thing that we used in our lessons that my mom taught my friends and I. So this is called a notebook viewer, and it's based off of the Jupyter notebooks. So this was our PyKids curriculum, and as you can see, all the classes are here. So introduction, and if I go back to presentation, okay. So here was what it. This is what a Jupyter notebook viewer looks like. So as you can see, we used the print command, and uh, we used help on print. Uh, this was lesson two. And so lesson three, we created um, the word missile using the Star Wars font, as I said. And lesson four. So on the top, it shows a color picker. And on the bottom, it shows a chessboard. So here was the demo I wanted to show you guys. So if we go to this website. So it's starting a notebook server. <coughs> It should be. So this is what the Jupyter home would look like. So if I make a new notebook, so I'm going to make a new notebook, and it'll be called Python 3. And it's loading. And if I go up. So this is what the Jupyter uh, editor looks like. So over here, we have the save checkpoint, save and checkpoint. So this is like when we save it. This will add a new one of these inputs, but this is called a cell in the Jupyter Notebooks. This will be to delete a cell. This is copy, paste. This will be to move cells between each other. This one is run, stop, and uh, restart, this, restart the entire editor. So I can just use normal commands like print, and I can just say think normal things like hello world. And it'll come, when I press the run button, it'll come as an output. Um, I did have something to show you guys. It was a, a loop, so it was, we had a variable. Uh, it was on my older laptop now, but, so if we did, um, if, so we were, I used the example of a car and gas. So um, a car, the C stands for the gas. So excuse me a second while I create this. C is greater So it would look something like this. So we would have an if elif statement so that this would look like the gas meter. So I'll just come back to this at the end. Um, our next steps in Python will be we want to learn more sh more concepts. We'll create and share more notebooks and contribute to PyKids. Uh, I, I want to become a teaching assistant to fellow grade schoolers. Oh, sorry. Um, we thank the Python community, Jupyter team, IPython blocks, and especially my mother for helping this. Thank you, and I hope you guys have a great time and a wonderful afternoon. Questions? Yeah. Um, so lies to children. Um, so when we're when we're giving. In so like what do you mean by lies to children like yeah yeah Okay. Oh, uh, well, so I would feel, I would not feel like, like, what do you call it, betrayed, but I would feel sort of like curious, and I would go and probably Google it or something. So my friend even asked me some sort of question like this. He said, if your teacher lies to you, what would you do? 
and I said that oh, sorry. I said that um, I would not feel betrayed. I would sort of feel curious, and I would ask other people what what they would feel and other people what they think about that topic. So, if you're using a math standards, I'd probably Google it up. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, I would recommend probably um, starting, well, so I think, I believe that Python is what uh, the basic language is. Um, so they could start with Python essentially. Uh, I, I, would, I would look at YouTube videos to understand, or I would Google something up like, what is this or what is that? And uh, once I understand the meaning, and there is actually a, a Jupyter page that gives you like the meaning of all of these, uh, all of this uh, curriculum and everything. So that's what I would do. More questions? All right, well, glad you guys came back. Excellent. And we've got a number of talks lined up, and then we've got the unconscious section to, to finish off the day. I'm gonna start off with a conversation about micro bits. It's pretty awesome. Don't forget, if you are a speaker today at uh, the Education Summit, we have a gift micro, micro bits for you. Come see me to get yours. And uh, I'll turn the time over to Christian. Hello. Um, my name is Christian. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm a board member of the EuroPython Society, also a EuroPython organizer. And I'm also a software and data carpentry instructor. And today we're going to talk about a project called Microbit Polska. Uh, before uh, starting with this, what's your plan for this summer? Because we have a conference <laughs> and you're all invited. <laughs> Uh, so it will be during this July in, uh, in Italy, in Rimini. So yeah, take your ticket. So what about the agenda? Uh, I will tell a little bit about the story of this project, uh, the idea behind the workshop, uh, the workshop that we had, and uh, some thoughts about my conclusion and about the future of this project. And then I will have some questions for you and I hope some questions also for me. So the story of this project started during EuroPython 2016. Uh, thanks to this guider, uh, we received some microbits for free during the, the conference. And uh, yeah, this is a microbit. Uh, is what I have here. It's like blinking. Um, it's 
uh, it's a micro device. And the cool thing is that you can use MicroPython inside this uh, micro bit. So during um, July or August of the 2016, I have a presentation uh, in, in Poland uh, during a conference called um, Coalition for Open Education. And I presented this, this idea about bringing also the microbit um, to, to Poland. Um, yeah, you can check the website for a follow-up about the, the conference. So the story behind the microbit is uh, they gave one million of this for free in UK. And, uh, well, maybe we can do something similar in, in Poland. Uh, of course, with, with a smaller number. Um, so I thought about 300. Um, so I, I decided, okay, let's, let's try this. So what I wanted, uh, as I said, you can use MicroPython on this. You can also use different uh, programming languages. Uh, I think I also Scratch. Um, uh, my point was to use Python. So um, what I also wanted to have is a course. So we prepared a workshop. Um, um, I wanted to have like a gentle introduction to Python. So without big expectation for the students. And at least at the beginning, the idea was to leave the, the micro bits to, to the schools. But the big problem was that uh, I didn't have micro bits. So I decided, OK, let's write an email to the PSF and let's see if we can have something. So I got a grant from the PSF to buy some micro bits. I also got some micro bits from the Microbit Educational Foundation. And Thanks to them, I, I started this project in Poland. So the idea of the workshop. Um, we decided to structure the workshop in this way. Uh, it, it has to be during the weekends because it, it was like a volunteer experience, uh, around six hours, um, with a number of between 20 and 30 students, uh, five teachers, and also five programmers. And if you're wondering about the teachers, they were there mostly because they want to uh, also uh, control and check for the students, but also because they want to learn Python. So these are the results. So we started this project called Microbit Polska. Uh, we prepare uh, all the materials. It's, it's online. Um, we made this, this material specifically to target students so, um, because it's, it's not that easy. So you can be a good programmer, but be a good teacher. It's something completely different. And it's, it's in both uh, English and Polish. Uh, this is a screenshot from the Gitbook. Uh, we decided to use this platform. So everything is like a, a markdown and you can Check the the website. It's it's everything there. You can find the English version and the Polish version, and uh, it's it's super easy to you know uh, navigate the website during the course and move between the pages. So until now, we had two workshops. Uh, one was in February in Gliwice. It's a city in the south part of Poland. Um, you can find the, the blog post about the first workshop. This is a picture of the students. Uh, they were quite happy after the workshop. And um, as I said, uh, this was the first workshop. Uh, we had around 30 or 35 students, uh, five teachers and five uh, Python programmers from the Gliwice area. And these are my thoughts after the, the workshop, the first one. So we had a great feedback from the students, from the teachers, and also from the programmers. Um, of course, you can always improve something. Uh, it's we, we, we didn't have like big ex expectation for the first workshop, but everything went fine. And English works well, uh, even if they speak Polish because they uh, I mean, at, at least for the students, was wasn't like a problem to to learn or to read the materials in, in English. Uh, it was more a problem related to the to the teachers. And uh, yeah, you can teach Python. It's not such a big deal. Also, if you want to um, cross the let's say the gap between uh, Scratch and Python, um, 
the errors or the issues that you can find are mostly related to the, the syntax. So it's uh, at least what, what we did is, okay, ju just, just try this code and you're going to learn that it's not going to work because you missed something and, and that works really well. So for the first workshop, we decided to, to leave the micro bits to the school and uh, we were expecting something and this is the, the follow up um, after the, the first workshop. So they're still using the micro bits. They are having classes there about Python and about the micro bits. Um, yeah, that that's was super cool for me. So that's, uh, as I said before, it works, um, not just inside the, the classroom, but you can also get pull requests from the students. So this is a pull request about uh, some correction about the Polish translations. And the second workshop war was uh, during May. It was in the city called Tishi. Um, about this, this last workshop, the feedback is a little bit different. The students were older, uh, so maybe the fit with the microbits is, is not good as with the first workshop. Uh, we, I mean, at least uh, I, I saw that it's really important to prepare the materials before, and the fact that you have uh, the Python programmers is not enough. You need someone to lead the workshop. Uh, you cannot just say, okay, this is the micro bit, this is the workshop, and with the website, just you know, run uh, to the web page. Uh, it's not going to to work really well. And yeah, this is also an experience that comes from uh, the software and data carpentry to prepare the material before the the class or the workshop. So now a little bit about the conclusion and the future uh, of this project. Um, I can say, and I think that this is shared between all of us, that Python works well in education. Uh, personally, I don't see um, um, a good problem in starting with Python directly and let's say uh, skipping, for example, Scratch. I think that it's, it's really easy because you can just uh, read Python and it's like pure English. So it's... Um, I mean, depending from the um, students that you're targeting, I think you can start directly with, with, with Python. And what about the microbit? Uh, I think it's, it's a good platform. Um, so you can compare this to many other pl platforms, like for example, the Raspberry Pi. The cool thing about the microbit is that you can just attach the microbit to your computer. Uh, you it's it's not just a computer as for example the raspberry pi you can so you need i don't know a keyboard or a monitor all this stuff you can just use your notebook uh, you can just attach using the micro usb and you can program this directly and but the problem that we saw was that with older students it's it's not the right platform probably so if you have like students older than i don't know 14 or 15 years it's it's too easy for them. Well, another thing is the experience of teaching. Uh, it's really wonderful. Uh, one of the best experiences that I had so far. Um, another very important thing is to follow the material that we have prepared. So, as I said before, uh, you cannot just give the, I don't know, the micro beats, this is the, and just play with them because um, <coughs> Yeah, probably they're going to have fun, but you're not going to receive a good feedback and they are not going to learn a lot from this workshop. Um, another very important thing that I saw was um, having 30 young students for six hours. So it was, yes. Um, so it was like for free for them. It was like outside of the normal um, classes. So they, they decided to be there and they decided to be there for six hours and you know learning new stuff and um, as I said it, it was like their choice and because they they were having fun so it's 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 a good point for for Python I would say and uh, about the future so 
So one of the problems that I saw was uh, lack of engagement from the teachers, and probably because I don't speak Polish and they speak only Polish, so this was a big, uh, at least at the beginning, was a huge problem. Um, so we will try and I will try to find um, a way to engage the, the teachers more, um, because it's, it's the only way in which I can uh, grow this project in Poland. Um, Another thing that we lack until now is feedback. Um, so we had like general feedback. Yeah, the workshop was good and, and yeah, let's do this again. But we should start to gather more data, more metrics and to have some kind of quantitative measure about the, the feedback and the quality of the workshop. And have more workshop organized by local people because uh, I cannot scale myself, so I need other people to um, run workshops uh, around Poland. And I think that sooner we will start to collaborate with uh, the PyPolska, it uh, is the Polish Python user group. So uh, they said that they are really um, interested in this. So probably in the future, um, we are going to work more together. So, this is all I got for you, um, but if you don't mind, I have a few questions for you. And first of all, how can I uh, actively engage more people um, in to this kind of project, but also in, um, let's say, open source project, because it's, it's something that I see very often, uh, like to be too alone, let's say. And another thing is that we have two very successful projects called software and data carpentry. So what about having something like kids carpentry? Um, because, um, so I think there was like in project to have this, this website with uh, a collection of materials about Python in education. And I think it's, it's, it's a good idea to continue on that road to have uh, a kind of collection to, you know, um, to avoid to have, I don't know, thousands of materials in different languages and they're not like together. So thank you uh, in Polish slides in Korea. Uh, so questions? Yeah. Okay. And if you have a web page that is for my Python workshop, but uses that as a screen and it says join to it, how can you contact yourself? Yeah. And I don't care. So when when that clicks and hopefully it will create the lesson and um, that will go to the response to you because that's one way that they can get a hold of the yeah. I see the link to it because it's just not not code, it's the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you said this many times that, yeah, okay, programming is like in English, but teaching is like in the language of the country. Yeah. So sometimes it's, yes, a uh, big gap. Yeah. Um, when did you begin to look at working with the students in Mathematics and Physics? Yes, so. Okay, so this is the website of the project. Um, this is the link to the material. So we started mostly from zero, so from printing a love word, and then we started to use all the, like the sensors inside the micro bits. So you have like, uh, and also the display, so you have like, um, animations, so you can like display this kind of images like earth, happy, smile, sad. Um, you can also use the buttons, so you have two um, physical buttons. Um, 
also you have the sensors so um, I mean it, it was it was six hours so we had time to, to teach a lot uh, it wasn't really related to Python so you don't have like this I don't know series of uh, topics like if condition loops and, and so on it was like okay let's give them a gentle introduction to Python using the micro bit and of course there was the last part in which they could like pick and mix everything together so uh, we had we tried to have this kind of um, approach using challenges so I mean, the last hour was just about pick and mix, so they could uh, seriously just play with the micro bits. So it was really cool to, to see them playing with the micro bits. Did you guys actually have like an actual session from Julian to um, in particular Python, or did you just use a workshop? So the plan is to have a series of workshops. The main problem is that um, I think I have something like 200 micro bits. So I need to decide if I want to leave the micro bits to the schools, uh, to the teachers, to the students. Uh, for the first workshop, we decided to leave the micro bits to the school. And yes, they're still using them. For the second workshop, we prefer to give just five micro bits to the um, uh, teachers. The problem is that we really don't know wh which is the best formula. So we have a limited amount of research and we, we need to find the best way to use them. Um, I know that they're running different projects across Europe using the micro bits, uh, but I think they have more money for this. So they, I mean, you can just drop, I don't know, 200 micro bits inside a school and that then will be fine. So yes, the plan is to have a series of workshop uh, and at, at least for now, it's more like a volunteer uh, kind of uh, approach. So I, I need to have some feedback. We plan to have, I don't know, two or three more workshops before the end of the year, but it depends mostly from, you know, uh, from the local. Yeah. I don't speak Polish, yes. Sorry? No, I do not speak Polish. Well, I decided, <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting these questions, so. <laughs> Well, I decided to, uh, I mean, I was traveling for three years uh, and I decided, okay, let's try a different experience. Uh, everyone is moving to London, to Berlin. Let's try it another country. So uh, it's not that bad. It's, it's a cool place where to be. And it's, I mean, English is, is it's commonly uh, spoken there, so it's not really a huge deal. Uh, but just between the students. So if you start to engage with the teachers, they speak just Polish. So at the beginning, I had some help with the you know, English-Polish problem, but um, if I want to scale the project, I need to speak Polish somehow. This is a problem that I'm facing right now. Also because I received uh, a lot of requests, but they are in, in Polish, so I need someone to translate this request, <laughs> and you know, it's just a week to reply to an email. Yes. Hi. Yeah. So uh, before starting the project, I um, presented the project during PyCon PL, PyCon Poland. Uh, then I tried to, I mean, I presented the project during the uh, local meetup, Python meetup. Uh, it didn't help a lot. Uh, I plan to reach directly the Jungle Girls and the uh, PyLadies there. So I will try this again. I hope to have you know better feedback this time. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, when you try something, it's, 
it's it's a good idea to to copy from something that <laughs> yes that has worked out before <laughs> oh you're welcome <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you plan to use it? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, you mean uh, like the places where I can have like run the workshops? So how do you how do you how do you do this? Who who is having the idea about this? So generally, I start from the teachers, and that's the problem. So I start to talk with the teachers. They say, "Okay, we're very interested in this. Let's let's do this," and then they bring the the students. So it's before uh, we need to get the teachers and automatically we can get the students from this. Something more? Uh, what about experiences here in USA about teaching kids? I, I think that Microbits is coming here. <laughs> Not yet? Yeah, I think it's coming here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you have another platform? Okay. Okay. Okay, you Ah, uh, sorry, there is like a question. Okay. Okay, but what is really expensive here? Because probably it's different from what is really expensive in Poland. Uh, so you need you need just this. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's, I think that uh, teaching using like a kind of gamification, it's, it's really, it's something that I, I want to try because we, we didn't try with the Raspberry Pi, we just tried with the Microbit. Uh, but as I said before, for older students, I think it's better the Raspberry Pi approach. Yeah, um, I think it's the last question.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you. A little more blinking. I can make them brighter. Ooh, can blind them. All right, let's see. All right, Full HDMI. Control combat right there in the middle of the <laughs> yep. screen. Uh, HDMI is what I've got. So let's there. And uh, okay, so let's see. Blind in there. Blind out there. Uh, sure. I guess I'll do that. Uh, let's save that folder. Yeah. Oh, I guess it doesn't want me to save the folder. Okay, I have no idea what's going on right now. Are you gonna talk into the microphone or gonna move? Um, yeah, microphone's probably good. I can use this. Ah, uh, this is cut. Yeah. So then it's just oh, zap. Totally. <laughs> Better for it. And I guess we should like go to Uber Dance. Christian, thank you very much. Appreciate that. We're going to have a conversation with Tony now. He's going to talk to us about tangible tools that you can use for teaching Python. Hey, thanks a lot, everyone, for being here. Um, so yeah, let's talk about physical computing and Python. Uh, but first, a little bit about me. Oops, get to my slide here. Uh, basically, my name's Tony, and I work for a company called Adafruit. And this is the founder and CEO of Adafruit, Lamore Freed. Uh, so quite an inspiration. She wanted to create hardware uh, that's easy for people to use. So people like students, teachers, educators, hobbyists, uh, anyone could use electronics to build something interesting and fun. Uh, and so very inspiring. I write a lot of Python code for Adafruit. So if you've ever used some of our sensors with like a Raspberry Pi, uh, you might have been using my code. Uh, and hopefully it worked pretty well. Uh, but basically, I have a lot of experience with using Python and hardware. And so in this talk, I want to go through uh, interesting options you can use to do physical computing with Python code. So how you can control hardware using Python. Uh, and first, what is physical computing? So this is a pretty good definition of it. It's basically creating objects using programmable hardware. And this comes from a really interesting research project that I found called My Interactive Garden. And this was created by a person named Marine Prisvilla. Uh, and it was a research project for education in Germany. I think it was uh, ninth graders in Germany where they built physical computing projects to go into a garden. So this wasn't like a robot competition or something. It was more of letting the kids be creative and build something uh, to go and populate a garden and be kind of interesting. So this is an example right here of uh, a bunny that's guarding an Easter egg. And there's a little infrared sensor in front of the egg. And when you pick the egg up, uh, the, the sensor detects when it's gone, and then the rabbit will move its ears, it gets angry, it blinks its lights. Uh, and, it, and you can see it's all programmed in Scratch. This was actually created using Arduino hardware, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, but this was using the visual programming language there. And she wrote a really excellent uh, set of papers about what they learned from this and uh, how it kind of applies to physical computing. And one thing that she went into is what are the pillars of physical computing? And so she lays out three things. Um, they're the processes, and this is basically how you do physical computing. So built on like constructionist learning where you start with a prototype and then you use your existing knowledge to build on it. So you learn maybe how to toggle an LED and then you can learn, okay, well now I can control a relay and a relay can control maybe a device or something like that. So that process of building on your knowledge uh, is one of the pillars. Uh, the second pillar are the products. So those are the things that you actually create. So like the bunny that guards the Easter egg, for example. Uh, and this is open to kind of a lot of interpretation. It lets kids uh, be really creative with, you know, they want to create something that's maybe personal to them. And then the third pillar are the tools. And so that's what you use to build things with physical computing. And that's what I want to focus on in this talk, is actually looking at what are some of the tools you can use uh, that can be uh, controlled with Python. And in that paper, they actually go through an interesting table right here. It's a little hard to read, so I put some of the um, 
basically the, uh, the categories here. So there are programmable toys and bricks, uh, IO devices, microcontrollers, and mini computers. And they went through, these are interesting options at the time. This paper is about four years old, uh, and it wasn't really specific to Python. But in this talk, I want to go through these categories and look at what are options today that exist that you can use with Python. So programmable bricks and toys that you might be able to program with Python, uh, and all the way down to mini computers and things. Um, so we'll dive in and, and get started here and hopefully do an updated version of this table that you can uh, take a look at to get some inspiration from. Now first, before I get too far into this though, when we're talking Python and hardware, there's a very important distinction that I want to make uh, as far as where Python runs. So you can have Python on your computer, and that's the normal C Python that you're used to. So you can use pip, you can use all the packages and modules, uh, you can use the same editing experience, you know, whatever Python editor, PyCharm, uh, everything you're happy with uh, works because it's Python running on your computer, but it might be tethered to some piece of hardware, like maybe a sensor, some lights, a servo, some kind of actuator. Uh, and it's possible, I'll show you a lot of options that do that tethered control where it's Python on your computer. Uh, now the drawback with that uh, is that the device always has to be connected to your computer. So if you wanted to build a robot, for example, uh, the computer kind of has to be on the robot. So it's going to be pretty big uh, or you need a really long cable to make it work. Now in contrast to that, there are options that can actually natively run Python. And so that's hardware that has uh, maybe C Python running on it or a different version of Python. Uh, we'll look at one called MicroPython. And so that's where you've got Python code running on the device itself. Uh, and there are trade-offs to that. It's not necessarily better or worse. Um, in a lot of cases, you might be more limited. So these devices typically don't have as much memory uh, or as many capabilities as your desktop computer. So your computer probably has like gigabytes of memory. You never even have to worry about, is my Python program too big? Whereas on a lot of these devices, they might only have kilobytes of memory, which means you, know, you get past a few hundred lines and it starts to get uh, a little difficult. So trade-offs there, you know, you get more portability, uh, but you might have less capabilities uh, in that case. And so we'll look at both those options for all these categories, uh, both tethered options and native options um, that are available. So let's start with programmable bricks and toys. Uh, the first thing is something called little bits. So these are pretty cool. These are basically uh, a modular electronics platform, and it's all based on magnets. So you have little components, like this is an LED bar graph. Uh, and these are a couple little potentiometers or little knobs. And you can just snap them together. You can snap a power source onto here. And you can build up complex circuits. Uh, and in most cases, whoops, I lose all these. In most cases, you don't actually have to program these, which is kind of the cool thing. Like if I snap the potentiometer onto the LED bar graph, and if I give it a, a power supply, I can just twist the knob and it lights up the lights. Uh, but there are some special bits. Oops, I went, uh, went too far. There are some special bits that are programmable. So there's a bit called the Arduino bit. Uh, this guy right here, and you can write code that runs on this bit and then snap on other bits to it and control them from here. And the cool thing is with the Arduino bit, you can actually load something on here called Fermata, and I'll talk more about that in a later slide. But you can load something on here that allows your computer to control this bit. So you hook this bit up to your computer, you hook other bits like lights and servos and things up to it, uh, and then you can have Python on your computer, so this is a tethered example, sending control commands to this bit that controls everything that's connected to it. So this is a good way if you wanted to add some simple ac uh, interactivity to your computer, like some lights or maybe move a servo, uh, you know, maybe the bunny rabbit that's guarding the Easter egg, it would just need to trigger a servo. Uh, and you don't want to learn about, okay, how do I solder these connections together? Uh, how do I build this circuit? That's a lot of stuff to deal with. You can use something like little bits where it just snaps together uh, and you're ready to go with that. So that's one option is the Arduino bit. Um, there's also a cloud bit that's like a really advanced bit that's also somewhat programmable. Uh, you connect bits to it, and then there's a cloud API that you can use to send it commands to control those bits. Uh, and it's also possible to control that with Python. I, I would say that's maybe a little more advanced because then you need to get into the, the whole web protocols and APIs, uh, but an interesting thing to explore potentially for uh, controlling that hardware. Uh, now, an example of native Python control would be with Lego Mindstorms. So Lego Mindstorms is kind of Lego's physical computing platform, uh, similar to little bits in that it's a modular system, now Lego compatible. There are things like servos and sensors that you plug into a Lego control brick, uh, that middle thing right there. And typically, you program that with a visual programming language. So you put together a control flow of maybe a robot you're building and how it should operate. Uh, but the interesting thing is with the latest versions of Mindstorms, uh, EV3, and there have been a lot of versions, so you might need to do some research and 
see uh, what's available, but EV3 is the latest one. You can load custom firmware on there, and there's a Linux-based firmware called EV3 Dev that you can load, and that gives you access to everything with Python. That gives you C Python, almost like a Raspberry Pi if you're familiar with that, uh, so you can run a normal version of Python directly on that control brick, and there's a pretty comprehensive Python API. It's uh, ev3python.com uh, that gives really simple code, like maybe 20 lines of code. I saw a line-following robot that can just interact with all those motors and sensors and things. Uh, so really cool example of, again, you know, you want simple devices that you don't have to learn about all the soldering and all the electronics. You just want to get started, but you want Python to natively run on it. Uh, you could definitely check that out. But it is a little more advanced in that you do need to load this custom firmware. Um, it's simpler with the EV3 uh, version of Legos because you just plug in a micro SD card. So, um, you know, unfortunately, it's not Python out of the box, but it's pretty close to that. Uh, there are also a lot of toy robots and drones uh, that you can control with Python. Some of them, uh, the actual, the manufacturer gives you an API for that, like this uh, iRobot Create in the upper right-hand corner. That's basically a Roomba that iRobot took, uh, but they made a uh, STEM version of that so that they published an API and there's a programming port you can plug into. It's just a serial port. And you can send it commands like, you know, move forward, almost like a logo robot. Uh, if you wanted to create maybe that Carol robot, uh, you can make a physical version of that. Uh, but it would have to be tethered to your computer. So these are all examples of Python on your computer sending control commands to some of these robots. Uh, and a lot of toys I looked around, actually people have reverse engineered some of the protocols. Like if any toy uses Bluetooth low energy or some kind of wireless protocol, in a lot of cases, people have kind of sniffed the traffic and written a quick little library to let you control it. So things like Sphero or uh, the dash and the dot in the lower left-hand corner, that's a really popular science uh, STEM kind of robot. Uh, there's a library I found that you can use to control that. Uh, even drones, like the Parrot AR drone, uh, there are uh, libraries out there to control that. The one thing I would say about these, uh, if it doesn't have an official library from the creator of the device, Sometimes you're on your own as far as support goes. Uh, some of these are maintained. Some of them seem like maybe a little project that was an interesting hack, but maybe not uh, might not be working as well. So be a little bit careful with these. I wouldn't say that they're uh, a perfect solution, uh, but an interesting thing that you might be able to take a toy and just uh, immediately do some control with it using Python. Again, that's a tethered example where it's Python on your computer controlling those. Uh, and there is a neat little robot that I found. Uh, that can actually do somewhat native control of Python. So this is a robot called Edison, and it's just a little two-wheeled robot, but it also has uh, a light sensor on the bottom here. And uh, it's normally you can program this with a graphical programming language, but the creators also provide a Python-based uh, editor here, this EdPy environment. And this will actually, you write Python code to control this robot, so you can move it forward, move it left, right, you can read the sensor, uh, and doing that all in Python code. But it's not actually a version of like maybe MicroPython or CPython that you're using. Uh, they call it a Python-like language because I think what they're actually doing is just converting that Python code into uh, native instructions that can run on the robot. But in any event, though, you're still programming it with Python. It's just you don't have access to all the Python libraries that you might expect. So you know, you're just limited to the basic robot control. Uh, but a really cool option that you might want to look at for uh, all native control, you know, teaching how to uh, program with Python, you could, again, make me uh, the physical version of the lo uh, logo robot using that. OK, so let's talk about I.O. devices. So I.O. devices, these are things that plug into your computer and give you some interface to like a sensor or an actuator, like a servo. Uh, all of these are tethered examples because they, your computer is what's controlling these. It basically, this just goes a little bit further down. You can see kind of that gradient of complexity from easy to uh, most difficult at the bottom. And so this is maybe a little more difficult than uh, some of the programmable bricks and toys where they try to take away all the electronics. You don't have to worry about wiring things up. With a lot of these I.O. devices, you might get a raw sensor, but they take care of interfacing with your computer. So most of these are like USB devices that you plug in, and you have a library that you can use to get started with uh, for those. And one example is actually mentioned in uh, the original paper for the My Interactive Garden Project uh, are these devices called fidgets. And so these are USB sensors and actuators. Uh, I almost think of these like grown-up little bits. So there, you can get all kinds of different sensors. And you can see this table here of uh, just a little sampling of what they sell. So you know, everything from like temperature to humidity sensor to servos, linear actuators. Uh, but these are closer to the actual hardware. So you might have to wire up relays, for example. So you might need to learn a little bit more about electronics. 
but they give you a USB output. So you just plug the USB port of your relay board, for example, into your computer, and then they have a really comprehensive set of libraries for pretty much every programming language, um, including Python. So you download their Python library, install a driver maybe on Windows, and uh, you're good to go. You can start writing code and you know, controlling a servo, turning on some lights, uh, some things like that. So that's an interesting option. It's kind of in a middle ground of uh, complexity. Uh, there are some boards, though, like Circuit Playground. This is a board that uh, we created, Adafruit. Uh, and let's see, I have an example of it. Oh, let me grab it right here. Uh, basically, this is a board that integrates a lot of components onto a single board. So it has lights, it has a sound sensor, it has uh, a little speaker on it, it has temperature sensor, an accelerometer to detect kind of movement. Uh, and there's an interesting thing that we did where we created this thing uh, Fermata firmware that I kind of mentioned before. So you can load this Fermata firmware onto this board and there's a Python API that we make available where you can call Python code to interact with all of the hardware on this board. I'll show a demo later of that, uh, but this is maybe an easier option where you, know, you plug this into your computer, you have Python running on your computer, and suddenly you can light up some lights, you can read some temperature sensors and do some interesting things. So I'll show you more later uh, after we get through uh, the rest of this. There's also a class of these I.O. devices that are called HCI devices, or human control interfaces. These are basically devices that look like a USB keyboard or mouse. So you plug them into your uh, computer, and then suddenly, you know, maybe uh, the, the device in the upper right, that's called Makey Makey, uh, that's based on capacitive touch. So if you touch one of those pads on there, it sends like an arrow or a button press to your computer. Uh, and then below there, uh, Circuit Playground, you can actually program that to act like a makey-makey where with capacitive touch, it will send key presses. Uh, and that's kind of the canonical example, I think, of uh, ca uh, capacitive touch is the fruit keyboard where you have a, a bunch of pieces of fruit. If you just connect them up uh, to the capacitive touch inputs, it can detect even the capacitance of touching the piece of fruit. Uh, and maybe play sounds and things. Now, the cool thing with this, uh, you know, you're not programming these devices, uh, but you can use them with Python programs uh, or really any kind of program. And so this was a neat example I saw at World Maker Fair last year in New York. Uh, a teacher basically did a project where he had his students create these pinball tables and it was makey makey powered so they would hook up to all the bumpers on the pinball table little pieces of aluminum foil so when the metal ball would roll across and maybe hit one of the bumpers the makey makey could detect that and send a key press to the computer and then you can see above there was like a scratch program running so that it could play sound effects or you know maybe keep a high score or something like that so that's, I think, a really cool example that you could use these HCI devices with Python. You can imagine maybe like a Pi game program, maybe you know, a version of Breakout or Asteroids or something, uh, where now you build a physical interface, but you don't have to worry about all the complexity of like trying to design this hardware. Use something like Makey Makey and you know, just detecting uh, some the touch of something or maybe a metal object touching it, and that can add interactivity to uh, some of your projects for that. Uh, so really interesting kind of uh, use of that device there. Okay, so let's talk about microcontrollers real fast. Uh, microcontrollers, these are tiny little computers. Uh, so you can write code, you can load the code onto these devices, they'll run it just like your laptop or your desktop computer. But the big difference is that these are much more constrained. So you have a lot less uh, uh, resources like memory. So on your laptop, you might have gigabytes of memory. On a microcontroller, you're lucky to have kilobytes of memory. Um, so it's you know, a little bit of a trade-off in some cases. Usually they're smaller, uh, more, uh, less cost in a lot of cases uh, than compared to larger computers. Now, one interesting thing with microcontrollers, um, you can do tethered control, so have Python on your computer controlling some microcontrollers, and that's using an Arduino. And so Arduino is a platform for electronics learning. Uh, it's been around for quite a while, and typically with Arduino, you write code in an, the Arduino programming language, which is C and C++ based. You use the Arduino editor and you load that code onto the board and it runs it natively. Uh, but you can use this thing called Fermata, and so Fermata is a special Arduino sketch or Arduino firmware that you load onto your Arduino board, and it basically makes that board controllable by any device that connects the Arduino, like your computer. So there's a little protocol that it implements, and then when that board is connected to your computer, your computer can basically take over the Arduino and say, okay, all of your inputs and outputs I want to control individually. You know, I want to set an output high, or I want to read one of your inputs, or read an analog input, or maybe control an LED that's connected to the board. Uh, so that's a really powerful example of tethered control where you know, maybe you don't uh, have a board that can run Python natively, but you want your computer to do something with hardware. Well, if your computer can talk to an Arduino, then that Arduino can interface with all of your hardware and you can control like switches or maybe you know, turn an LED on and off, for example, or maybe control a servo to move a, a robot around. 
Uh, and I also just want to mention, too, um, there are a couple really good for model libraries you can use with Python. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch out there. I've used a few in Pymata AIO uh, is kind of a more advanced library. It uses the async I.O. interface, so if you're doing really cool advanced uh, stuff with Python 3, that's a good one to look at. Or just the older PyMata library. These are both created by the same uh, person. Uh, that one works without async I.O. It's a little bit simpler, uh, but they give you that control over your Arduino. Again, a tethered example where you have a microcontroller, uh, but your computer and Python on your computer is controlling it. And then there's also a class of boards where you can run Python natively on them. And these are actually pretty new. And uh, you might have heard of these. Uh, I think Scott actually talked about them earlier in a lightning talk. Uh, and basically, these are boards that run a version of Python. So they're, it's called MicroPython. Uh, and what you're seeing, this is the first MicroPython board, the Pi board. It's created by uh, the creator of MicroPython. And basically, this runs uh, almost a complete Python interpreter. I think 90% of the Python 3 language is implemented. I went through all the differences, and it's very obscure differences. I mean, you can do uh, object-oriented programming. You can do functional programming. You can do lots of things with MicroPython. The one thing is you don't have access to the standard Python library. So all of the modules that you might use on your desktop aren't necessarily available in MicroPython, again, just because of the memory constraints. So like this MicroPython board here just has like a few hundred kilobytes of memory, so you're never going to be able to fit all of the uh, Python modules onto it. Uh, but they're making really good progress as far as adding things like you know JSON, uh, decoding, there's even like regular expressions, parsing, and things like that. Um, so again, so that's Python running on your microcontroller. Uh, the Pi board there is a really cool example. So that was the first board. It's a really powerful board. It uses uh, this really powerful microcontroller that has a lot of memory and a lot of peripherals. Uh, but it shows off a lot of the cool features of MicroPython. Uh, and one other feature I just want to mention too with it is that MicroPython has a REPL built into the board. So you know when you run Python on your desktop, you can interactively enter Python code and see the results and the output. Exact same thing applies to MicroPython, where you can connect a MicroPython board to your computer and suddenly start issuing commands and running Python code interactively. And that's very powerful, I think, for education because you don't have to learn about, you know, with typical microcontrollers, you've got to compile code and upload it and learn this whole tool chain with MicroPython, plug the board in and start running code. Uh, and seeing the results of it. And I should also just say that it is a little bit early days with MicroPython, so uh, it's only about three or four years old as far as the project goes. So uh, compared to like the Arduino ecosystem, there's not as many uh, tools and editors and documentation and things. A lot of that stuff is being built right now. Uh, so it's a good opportunity if you want to contribute to a lot of projects. I think there are a lot of opportunities there for it. Uh, I want to run through real fast just a few of the MicroPython boards that are out there uh, to just give you a, an idea of what's available and what might be interesting. Uh, so all of these boards run MicroPython, so you can program them with Python. Uh, the ESP8266 is a really popular little low-cost Wi-Fi microcontroller, originally built for a smart light bulb, and then the creators realized, oh, the open source community loves this thing. Like, let's give them the tool chain and let them go wild with it. So MicroPython is ported to it. Um, it's a really good balance of price and performance. You get a decent amount of memory, uh, less memory than like the Pi board, but it's less expensive than the Pi board. Uh, but you don't have a lot of I.O., so you can't control a lot of devices. It just has a few digital uh, inputs and outputs and just one analog digital converter. Uh, but you can still do a lot with that. It does have Wi-Fi control, and there's really good support for that in MicroPython. So this is great for like IoT scenarios, um, but it's also you know, just a good option to just get started with MicroPython. Uh, there's also the microbit, which you've heard a lot about uh, earlier today. So that's an excellent board uh, the BBC created and gave to, I think, all the seventh graders in the United Kingdom. And that's a board that uh, originally was, I think, written to be you know, programmed with different like, graphical programming languages, but a port of MicroPython was made for it. Uh, and it's really amazing because this falls kind of on the low end of capabilities. There's not a lot of memory on this board, uh, but it's still able to run a full Python interpreter. Uh, but the one thing to know is that you don't, I think you only have around four kilobytes or so of uh, memory for your code. Uh, so don't expect to do a ton of things, but you can still do some very cool uh, interactive projects with this. Uh, there's a really comprehensive API that's available that gives you access to all of the sensors and components on this board. There's a grid of LEDs, uh, there's a compass, uh, some buttons and things like that. So it's really easy to get started with Python. And there's also really good tooling for this one too. So there's an online editor where you just go to a web page, type in your Python code, it gives you a file and you can copy it onto the board uh, and get started. And there's also a desktop editor too. So that's, that's a good option to get started with, uh, especially for a beginner. And then there are also some boards uh, that we make from Adafruit here. So these are the M0 boards. We have the Feather M0, Metro M0, uh, the, also a board called the Circuit Playground Express. All of these use the same processor. It's this Atmel SAMD21 processor. It's an Arduino-based uh, or a processor that came from a line of Arduinos. Uh, but we've been able to port MicroPython to it. 
Uh, and we actually call it CircuitPython. So we took MicroPython and created a derivative uh, because we want to kind of uh, simplify some of the APIs and make it a little bit easier so that uh, when you get started, you know, right now, each of the MicroPython boards is a little bit different in how they uh, expose their hardware. So since we have a lot of different boards that we create from Adafruit, we want to have one API that everyone uses uh, to, to use our hardware. So that's kind of why we took it and called it CircuitPython, just so it's not as confusing. But it's based on MicroPython. It's uh, derived from that code. Uh, and it's, uh, these are excellent boards. They, they're a little more memory than the micro bits, so they have 32 kilobytes of memory compared to like 16 kilobytes. Uh, but they're kind of hitting that sweet spot of price to performance. So they're not as powerful as the Pi board. Uh, they're actually a little less powerful than the ESP8266, uh, but uh, you can get some more interesting options. And the Circuit Playground Express, I'll talk more about that, but that's a version of the Circuit Playground board that I mentioned that has things like lights and sensors built into it but it has this uh, SAMD21 processor where you can run MicroPython, and we'll look at a demo of that uh, in a moment here. Uh, and then the YPy and the LowPy, these are from a company called PyCom. These are very cool IoT-focused boards. So all of these boards have interesting things like radios. Uh, the LowPy has this 900 megahertz radio that can do like mile-long wireless communication. Uh, the really cool thing, a little more IoT focused, not so much maybe education focused, but you could certainly use these in maybe more advanced uh, classes. Uh, and also, I just want to mention PyCom has some really cool stuff they're doing. They have uh, some apps and a whole kind of desktop editor. There's an, a plugin for the Atom text editor. And I think they're even working on a cloud system. So they're putting a lot of effort into an, more of an ecosystem uh, for some of their boards there. Uh, that you can look at. So again, those are all MicroPython boards. Uh, they run Python code natively on them, uh, and there are a lot of cool things. And I, I expect this time next year, we'll probably have a whole new crop of boards because there's a lot of movement, and a lot of new things coming out with that. Okay, and uh, at the end here, uh, real quickly, mini computers. So this is the last category. This is at the bottom, so this is the most complex. Uh, and the, the difference between a mini computer and a microcontroller is that mini computers are usually larger as far as they have more memory, and they usually run a full operating system. So something like a Linux or there are even Windows versions that run on these mini computers. Uh, and so that just brings a little more complexity because you know if you're new completely to physical computing, you might need to learn about electronics uh, and microcontrollers. And then with mini computers, now you have to learn about like Linux and command line and some of the things like that. Uh, so you know, just be aware of like you get more capabilities. Uh, usually, you can use the full version like C Python on these machines, uh, but there's more complexity that comes with that. Uh, and the Raspberry Pi, of course, is kind of the most well-known one. Uh, it's a huge success. It was created um, as, uh, by the Raspberry Pi Foundation as an education-focused board. Uh, and there are multiple variants of it now. You can get small boards, the Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, so a really cool board. There's an ecosystem of hats that are ex uh, expansion boards that kind of stack on. And you can add things like motor controllers or LCD displays and things. Uh, so you know, if you're looking at a mini computer, the Raspberry Pi is the first one to look at for sure. Uh, and there's really good Python support for it. So this natively runs C Python, either two or three, um, you know, both versions, uh, great GPIO libraries, and a huge ecosystem of just people using it, lots of guides and tutorials and information available. Uh, other mini computers, just real fast I'll mention, there are boards like the BeagleBone Black, a uh, really good one for drones because it has this really cool real-time real control. Uh, the one thing to be aware with other boards, just be careful of boards that say that they're Raspberry Pi compatible. You know, just because they have a 26-pin header doesn't mean that all of the same software will work because if it's a different chipset, your Raspberry Pi driver might not work with that board. So you might be able to plug the hardware in, but you might not be able to control it very well. So you know, be aware. Sometimes a lot of the manufacturers like to claim, like, hey, it's Raspberry Pi compatible, but mm, that's not the full story. So OK, so here's a quick little summary. This is the updated table uh, that I made. And uh, I, I won't go through this, because actually, um, you can just grab the slide deck here and look at the table later. Uh, and real fast, I just wanted to run through two little demos uh, in the last few minutes that I have. So I'll show an example of tethered control of a circuit playground using that Fermata. And then I'll show an example of MicroPython uh, native control of Python on hardware. So these are both using circuit playground boards. So I'm going to plug in. This is the Circuit Playground. It's, I call it Classic. It's our older version of Circuit Playground. Uh, and then I'll show you the Express board in a moment. So you know this one does not natively run Python, but I've loaded it with that Fermata firmware ahead of time. And that's basically an Arduino sketch that you load on using the Arduino editor. And OK, so now it's connected to my machine. And by default, it's waiting for my computer to connect. And it plays this little animation. Uh, but what I'm going to do is open up a terminal right here. And I'll bump up the screen size a little bit. Uh, OK, so this thing is connected, and it shows up as a serial port. And I'm going to run a uh, command. So I'm going to run a, a script that I wrote in Python. 
And this is using a little library uh, that's using the Fermata protocol, and it's going to start controlling this board. So when I run this, and it takes a moment, it's using that PyMata library that I mentioned. Um, it's going to connect to the board. It's going to figure out how many uh, I.O. pins and things that it has. Uh, but once it connects here in a second, uh, so now it's running, and it's doing a little animation. So it's animating the colors moving around this board. Uh, and it's just a simple little API call that uh, you call in Python to do that. And if I press some of the buttons, that changes like the speed of the animation, or this button changes. Uh, oops, oh, looks like it maybe crashed here. Uh-oh, the demo gods are not, uh, not, <laughs> not dealing well. Uh, so all right, well, anyways, maybe this demo didn't work super well. Uh, I have a feeling it's this little USB connector, uh, the, the little Apple connector. Anyways, uh, let me show you native control. So I was going to show you basically you can press the buttons and it changes the speed and the color of the animation. Uh, but this is the exact same thing that I wanted to show with uh, the Fermata control, but this is native control. So I just plugged in a battery. You know, it's not comp uh, connect connected to any computer. And this is cool because it's animating the pixels. And if I press the buttons here, uh, then you can see that changes the speed. Uh, and then this button changes the color, so it changes to green. Uh, and this is all Python code that's controlling this. And if I plug this into my computer, I don't know, we'll see if this works, uh, although I think this USB uh, adapter might not be working super well. But Scott showed earlier, with this board, you can plug it into your computer and it shows up as a USB drive so that you can actually access the Python code that's on your uh, device. So you see the CircuitPy uh, device, and then this main.py is actually my Python code directly off of the device. And here it is in the Atom text editor. So you can see this is Python code um, that's running. And I have a little circuit playground uh, module that I created in MicroPython that gives me a little bit simpler access to uh, control these. So like this is the call right here that sets uh, the color of the pixels, for example. Uh, so just real quick little demo of, uh, oops, some of the examples that you can do with native control of uh, MicroPython on a board like this. So this is the circuit playground express board uh, that I was using. So that's it. I think we're probably just about out of time. but. Thanks a lot, and I don't know if we have time for any questions or anything, so. Just about one minute. Okay, <laughs> one or two questions, potentially, so. Oh, yeah, question. Oh, inter like a, oh, interesting, like a network control of other hardware. Yeah. Um, I don't, but I have heard like Node Red is kind of interesting. It's, um, I think, more on the Raspberry Pi. I don't know if it works with a lot of hardware, but it's this thing that IBM has where they're trying to do all these IoT scenarios more, I think, with like a graphical interface where you just plug together devices in a, like a graphical view. You build this graph of like, you know, here's my output and here's some input, and you just wire them together. That might be sort of related, um, but yeah, no, I don't know of anything that's maybe like Fermata over the network uh, necessarily, unfortunately. So, but if you can find a tool that tunnels serial over network, uh, which I'm sure there's some kind of Unix tool that does that, then in theory you could probably make that work with Fermata over network. Yeah, right. MQTT, that's more of like a kind of control protocol. Like, not necessarily, you wouldn't use Fermata. You'd need some device that's probably has network control. Like the ESP8266, for example, could talk a protocol like MQTT, uh, and then you can maybe send it control messages and things. And yeah, I don't know. That would be really neat, though, to see a Fermata protocol over MQTT, maybe with the ESP8266, but I don't know of one, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, a little advanced. How many buzzwords can you throw into it? But yeah. So, cool. All right. Well, excellent. Thanks so much. So what we're going to do, you guys walk into the next room. Um, we've got about a couple of topics that we will run those. We've not yet voted, so it's a chance to vote real quick. In about three minutes or so, we'll tally up all the votes and find some of the best, or the, the topics that have the most interest, and we'll separate the folks into one of the two rooms. Head on over, here's your vote. You get three votes. Get your votes done. We have three votes that have been Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, cool. Um,
Bob. 